Today, we're looking at uh, the construction of this church. Of course, this is our second brick structure on this property. The first one, we're talking about the foundation. In this one, we have the records of when the vestry met to award the contract. And so in this time period of 1750 to 1850, well, of course, we've got to take a look at the construction of this church. We're glad to have with this noted architectural historian, Carl Lounsbury, who's going to talk about the architectural trends and, and developments which uh, influence this building and the details of this building. And I'm going to stop talking and welcome him to the podium. Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I will not preach uh, too long. <laughs> Uh, but I also, I, I will actually start with a little bit of a refresher for you about last week, because um, I, I have worked with, and as you'll see, I appreciate the work that Thane and Dave Brown do uh, here in, in this region. Uh, I get calls from them all the time. Uh, I've come out and looked at their stuff here last week, uh, and it, it, it's been great. I wish they'd move a little faster. It was 20 years ago when they first uh, started doing some excavations in, uh, as you'll see, uh, after Hurricane um, Isabel in 2003 and in 2004, they dug up some interesting things. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of background of that first church, just a, as a refresher, to give you a sense of what, how this building is so different from uh, most that preceded them in many ways, and how this church also, and other churches like this, these cruciform-shaped churches, uh, are unique to colonial Virginia. They don't exist anywhere else in colonial America. Uh, so that's uh, that's what we're <coughs> excuse me talk about. And then, uh, like all the buildings I go into, <coughs> I've looked at probably about 500 buildings from the colonial period up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, and I, I, was, I, I find that a lot of the buildings I go into are great because they survive, and then I think about it, uh, they survive as perhaps because the congregation has disappeared. And they're, in, in that sense, they're kind of survivors, but the congregation is gone. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, and when you go to other places where the congregation has thrived and, 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 and o over several centuries, uh, oftentimes they grow and they have to replace their earlier churches because they came too small, and that's what happened here. Um, and, um, but they lose that, that, that past. Uh, so it's a sort of a trade-off. And what we'll see here in the period I'm talking about is this sort of really uh, the effervescence of Anglicanism in colonial Virginia's architecture in the 40 or 50 years before the revolution. And then it's absolute nadir uh, between about 1790 and uh, 1830 when uh, but for the grace of God, it, most buildings disappeared. Uh, they were abandoned. Uh, people fled. Uh, I won't say fled, uh, but it's hard to put this. But Baptists and Methodists uh, became very predominant in this part of the, the world at that time. And so I will read you a couple of quotes of what this place was like in the 17, in the night, uh, sorry, 1820s. Um, when things were just beginning to revive. And so this kind of pretentious title that I put up here, and I have no idea where that came from. I must have had a very rich dinner or something. Um, you know, is <laughs> basically, I was trying to say, you know, I won't say things were great, but you know, this place was thriving here in the uh, 1720s, 30s, 40s, 50s, through the 70s, and then it barely hangs on through those really black years between the 1790s and 1830, and then starts to revive slowly. But, you know, again, it's here now, and we're very happy <laughs> that you survived. All right, let's see if I can work. Okay, so 
uh, here's I want to talk about uh, 90 feet south of here and, and very quickly uh, and look at the, the fragments of what has been turned up by Thane Har Harpole and Dave Brown of the very uh, of the of the brick church that preceded this church. So in 1750, if we take 1750 as my start date, that church is here, it's standing, and uh, it is a very, uh, a very important church. In fact, in 1709, let's see, oh, there's our heroes of, the, of, the, of this earlier story, Thane, and, and I've worked with them for at least 30 years and, and uh, come out whenever they call me because usually they have something good that has turned up. Uh, in 1709, uh, William Byrd II of Westover, who's always good for a quote because he wrote these juicy uh, uh, um, diaries. And so on November 6, 1709, he, he writes, about 11 o'clock we rode to the church of Abington Parish, which is the best church I have seen in the, in the country. The best church is, is this one. Okay, so here, here's what they found so far, is the two corners on the south side of the church. The first one in April, uh, and then the second one just uh, about seven or eight, nine days ago in uh, the eastern side, and they found traces also of uh, the north wall, so that's what I'm telling them. At least they got the size of it, which is approximately 62 feet by 29 feet, so that's important to keep in mind. They also discovered in 2004 this brick ball um, when the tree fell over, so keep that brick ball in mind because we will see it uh, elsewhere at Yukamako Church, but also at the First Bruton Parish Church. And just which brought me over here on Thursday, October 13th at 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, told them don't leave, and I ex explained that's a brick window mullion, which is very exciting because there are only a few others that survive. Uh, at, uh, there was one, several at Bruton Church, but also at St. Luke's Church and others. So this is the promise of what a good country church is going to be. So. Uh, what he said is that he had, he had this, you know, this, this great country, good country church. Uh, then he, he also writes, <clears throat> We heard a sermon by Parson Smith after church. We returned to Mr. Burroughs, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Berkeley and his wife were, were with us, so he probably went to Fairfield. We dined late, and I ate boiled beef and pudding. In the evening, we sat and talked till 10 o'clock, and I told abundance of lies by way of diversion. <laughs> Not sure what that means, but anyway, that's you take William Byrd for everything you can get. Um, so we don't know the date of this brick church, the first brick church here that, that's standing in 1750, but uh, I presume it was built probably in the fourth quarter of the 17th century. So if the parish is established, you know, in the 1650s. Uh, or late 40s or 50s, then this is probably the second church here, and the first one was probably a wooden church, which if we can get Thane and Dave to move a little faster, we might find that one too, uh, but we'll wait. So what we know, I mean, we don't know a whole lot about the early period of, of churches in Virginia, as you'll see, uh, but the three that I think probably were very similar to this one to, to receive the praise that William Byrd showered on it as the best uh, church in the country uh, suggests that it was a rival or very much as, as well built as these three. The, the top one that you see here is uh, Jamestown Church. This is the third church. It was started in the 1640s and probably wasn't finished until the 1650s. It was burned in 1676 by Nathaniel Bacon's uh, men in September that year and rebuilt and finished up by 1680. It got a tower put on probably in the 1690s. Uh, below it is a, a church that does survive. Uh, that is what you know as St. Luke's Church or in Iowa White County, uh, often called at the time Newport Parish Church. 
uh, which is not 1632 as advertised on their sign, but probably after 1677 based on dendrochronology that we did there a few years ago. And this is when I was still working at Colonial Williamsburg, and we said, you know, if it's just, you know, changing the sign, we can bring our Colonial Williamsburg painters over to do that for you. But they, I think they still finding it hard to accept that it's probably not 1632, but uh, probably the early 1680s. But it's there, which is all the may more surprising. And then the third one is the very first Bruton Church built in the early 1680s, uh, a, a few feet to the north uh, west uh, in the churchyard at, uh, at Bruton Church in Williamsburg. Uh, that was torn down in 1716 when the present church was built uh, and excavated in 1938 when a crazy lady uh, from, well, I can't say, I guess, I mean, you think of them today as new age people, but she was reading uh, <clears throat> the lettering on all the uh, tombstones outside in Bruton Churchyard and, and somehow decided this is where the, the meaning of life was in, buried inside this church. In other words, she said that the, uh, the, the, the crown jewels, which I didn't know were lost, were here, as well as the um, uh, evidence of, of, uh, <laughs> uh, that Shakespeare did not write all of Shakespeare's poems. I mean, it's that sort of stuff. And uh, so she, she actually got the vestry to do some archaeology there in 1938. And uh, one of my predecessors saw the archaeology and, and measured it, and so that's the plan of this church here. Uh, they came back in 1991 and did more ar archaeology because uh, the, that woman uh, had followers out in Arizona and Santa Fe and places like that and insisted that we dig more. Uh, didn't find any jewels or anything like that. So those are the three buildings that I think are prototypes for what is out here. Now, we call those uh, those plans, you saw they're nice rectangles, uh, and, a, and a historian called Nigel Yates called these kind of buildings a traditional Anglican plan, a plan that uh, evolved in the late 16th century at, at, at the time of the Reformation during uh, uh, Edward VII and Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, when new buildings came along out in the countryside, they, they followed this pattern, which we will go over. Here's, here's, a, here's actually a church that we've looked at uh, that shows the fittings in them and, uh, from 1601. So this is what we would call a traditional Anglican church. It's, uh, and, and here's another one that uh, is survived from 1662 that has all the interior fittings. Uh, and this is what you would see in a church probably, <clears throat> this church down here, uh, in the late 17th century. There, all these characteristics that you see here uh, would have been in this church. Uh, it would have a central aisle uh, with either pews, or it might be just benches at this time here, and only a few pews. And then almost toward the east end, there'd be this screen called the chancel screen which divided the chancel where they took communion from the body of the church where uh, the, everything, uh, the rest of the sermon took place. And then the pulpit was located near this chancel screen on either the north or south wall. And in this case, it's, it's a, what they call a triple decker. So you would have the clerk's uh, desk here, the reading desk where most of the uh, the service would take place here, the minister would be seated here, and then uh, only to climb up into the pulpit to deliver his sermon um, and then climb back down. And then uh, you see the screen here, a highly decorated screen. I'm not sure what these characters are here, uh, but this is what divided. And people would come up and sit around a, uh, I think I have a drawing of it. They would sit around these benches, and then they'd be called up uh, to take communion there and uh, in the railed-in uh, enclosure with the communion table right against the east wall with a very large window uh, uh, lighting it. So that's a traditional 
Anglican plan, and that's what is out here. How do we know that? Because they brought it to Jamestown in 1607-1608, and uh, you know it, it takes a while, but eventually they got around to excavating, and they found, if you look right here, about 10 or 12 years ago, this area here, uh, these deep holes, and they were deep, these are sometimes seven or eight feet deep in the ground, you can still see post holes, uh, defined a very large building that turned out to be a church built in 1608. Uh, that church, um, you see here, the excavating it, and the, the plan of it here, and they're actually, later on they found another post here, which is very important, uh, but here it is, these are, the building was basically 64 feet long by 24 feet. And you see these are four graves in the chancel. So there would have been a, a, a screen probably about here across dividing the, the uh, chancel from the, the body of the church. So the archeologist asked me and others to uh, come up with a design for what it probably looked like very simple building. It was, we you know, it was post in the ground. It had mud walls and thatched roof. So it's very vernacular in that sense, very plain. Uh, <clears throat> with a couple of doors, like we saw at Langley Chapel, and windows not really placed symmetrically. The idea of symmetry has yet to influence uh, church architecture. So you, they put windows where they needed them. Uh, but the same sort of pattern here. Uh, when they were digging, they were digging this way. And I said, if you find a post right there, that means you have a south wall entrance, uh, which was very typical of many uh, English churches at the time. And so here's, here, you know, they, when they found that post, I was vindicated. And so he, here's where we think. I mean, this is all hypothetical. We know there was a font made of wood, uh, carved out of wood there, probably benches instead of pews. Uh, then the pulpit located next to the chancel screen, and then here is the uh, communion table located up against the east wall, and the burials were located in here. So that's, that's it. That's the traditional Anglican plan brought over. That building was replaced by a wooden structure on this site right here in 1617, and then in the 1640s, that wooden structure was replaced by a brick building and this is the foundations that they found of the brick building. Uh, with these, these are buttresses here. Uh, you'll see these, and this is what I told Thane and Dave, that the next thing they need to find are the buttresses out here. Uh, I hope they find them. If not, that's fine. Um, but this is the end with the uh, a doorway, chancel door located here. The tower is, is a later addition. This building, uh, built in the early 1680s, St. Luke's, still survives. It's, it was much changed, but this gives you a perfect idea, uh, take away the tower, of what your church would have looked like in 1750. Uh, with the, well, buttresses or not, but had mullions in the windows. So the brick mullions is what I'm talking about, are these divisions in the window. And that's what they found a couple, a uh, few days ago, which is great. Uh, in terms of plan, you can see this is the one, the English one I showed you here, and here's the plan of Newport Parish Church, uh, or uh, St. Luke's Church here. Pretty much the same layout, so that's, that's where that pattern is coming from. Uh, this is 1950s, it, you know, if you squint, uh, it looks better than it does in reality, um, but they did a pretty good job. You get a sense of what uh, the interior was like with this chancel screen that they put across here and the pulpit located along here. Uh, there, we did find, uh, this is um, some drawings of a church, uh, the very first uh, church in St. Paul's Parish in near Edenton, North Carolina, before Edenton was, they were sending this off to the Bishop of London to beg for window glass. Uh, to fill in the windows, and so they had drawings of the building. But I just wanted to show you the plan. This is, this is the earliest drawing we have of, an, of a plan of a church in this region. And you see it's about 24 feet long, and what's that, 40 feet wide, 
It's a post in the ground structure. These are pews. Here's where the pulpit and reading desk was located about along the wall. There's the chancel. You see the same drops and stuff that we saw in the English example of the chancel screen. The only difference is that there are two uh, chancel doors, one on the north as well as the south, and then the raised um, uh, space for the, um, the communion table railed in there. So that's, that's the pattern, and that's what we see. All right, here's a very bad drawing <laughs> of Bruton Church, the only drawing of a guy named Michelle, who was there in 1702. He, he, he left off the buttresses, left out the number of windows, but he did draw, it, and this is his idea of what brick, brick building looked like. But it had shaped gables, which is very interesting, uh, and a churchyard wall. And here, see that finial up there? It's that ball. Uh, that's perhaps what you found here uh, in 2004. So that's, that's a possibility that a churchyard looked like in 1750. Uh, plans, I mean, they're almost spot on. You know, they're all 62 feet 9 or 62 feet 6 inches by 29 feet. You know, that's sort of become standard. It could be slightly smaller or larger, but they're pretty much all the same. You see the buttresses here on these. So what happens? That pattern, this traditional Anglican plan, continues to be built here in Virginia in the 18th century. Most parishes built smaller churches than this one, and they built these long rectangles like this. They're, uh, and I'm just showing you Merchant's Hope, which is dated by dendrochronology to 1743, but it's the same plan as, with the long uh, center aisle with pews or benches on either side, the, um, the altar piece, I mean the altar up in the east end and the pulpit probably located near there. Uh, by the 1720s, they get rid of the chancel screen that goes out of fashion, and so it's an uninterrupted view by that time. Uh, one of the largest of these is uh, your neighbor Ware Parish Church, dated 1719 from dendrochronology, and this is this is about this is as large as they'll get, uh, and it, it, it's they don't do this elsewhere, and you can see it does have the the two chancel doorways like the one that I showed you at St. Paul's and Edenton, um, but it's a very large building. Uh, it's I can't read that. It's like 3,200 square feet, which is a very large space, and they don't go that far. Most Virginia churches, when they get a larger congregation, uh, they add a wing on. They'll add a wing. And we know here from a later minister uh, in, in Bishop Mead saying that this building down there got a wing sometime in the 18th century. So it probably looked something like St. John's Parish or something like that. Um, and so this, is, this leads to uh, the Reverend Thomas Hughes, the Bishop of London, who, uh, I mean, sorry, writing to the Bishop of London uh, in 1724, sort of reporting the state of his parish, uh, which several Virginia parishes did write, and we can sort of judge the growth of Anglicanism in, in this, um, in this uh, colony in 1720s. Unfortunately, we don't have many other pieces like that. So anyway, he, he, um, he, he reported that they had about 300 families in the parish. The services were held every Lord's Day, uh, Good Friday, and Christmas in the forenoon uh, when they, they actually had communion. Uh, there were 60 or 70 communicants. Uh, the Holy Communion was administered three times a year, and about 200 Christians generally attended the church. Uh, Mr. Hughes said that his surplus had never been used in the parish, and he reported his salary of 1,600 pounds of tobacco, which I don't know if it's been upped any since then, but you know, who knows. He also reported he had a glebe, which he occupied, and it was in good condition. So. In other words, Abington Church in 1750 was a growing parish. They were uh, a sizable congregation that probably could no longer fit down here. And after about 75 years, let's say, 
It may have looked old. It, it was probably uh, in need of repair, as all churches are always in need of repair. Uh, always need a new roof. Um, that's that's going to be there. So what they did, oh, here's just another example here of, of a, a, a church that adds at Vauders Church in Essex County. You can get a sense of the additions either put on the north or the south side of the, of the um, building. So in the Virginia Gazette, that font of all wisdom, um, there's a notice on February 7th, 1751, is given that on Wednesday, the 27th day of that month, a vestry will be held at Abington Church in the county of Gloucester in order to, to contract with workmen to build a new church in that said parish. So they want to build a new church. And what do they get? They get this, this church here. They build this church uh, between 1751, the advertisement, and 1755. And we know that James Skelton is the undertaker. Now, the undertaker is the 18th century word, not for a guy who buries you, but one who probably buries you in debt, uh, but builds uh, the churches. He's, he undertakes buildings. Uh, we can call him contractor or builder. That's what James Skelton. But who was James Skelton? Well, until, I don't know, 20 years ago, we didn't know he was the builder of this until what showed up when at the Library of Virginia were these old papers that were in court cases uh, filed in the 1820s uh, complaining uh, basically the grandchildren of, of some of the workmen who worked here had not been paid, well, the, the, their grandparents had not been paid yet. And they said James Skelton uh, was the contractor. So that's the first time we know because we don't have any papers, anything dealing, or even vestry books that tell us about the building of this building. So who is James Skelton? Well, he uh, turns out to be a very important builder in this region in, um, in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, I don't know when he was born. I would just say maybe the 1690s, could be 80s. That would give him a fairly long lifetime. Uh, the first time I see him in, in the records is in 1719 at St. Peter's Church. Uh, that was a very fine brick church built by Thomas Brickwall Jackson in 1703. And in 1719, they asked somebody to build a wall around the parish churchyard, and a skeleton gets the job. And they, they require it to be as well as the wall around the Capitol in Williamsburg. Uh, so that, that's their precedent for that. Uh, in, he's, he's here in Gloucester. I don't know where he lives. He's here in Gloucester in 1721-23, building a brick church for Petworth Parish, uh, your neighbor, uh, and he was the builder of that church. Um, so he, he has experience building brick churches. 1730s, he's in Goochland County now. He builds a brick courthouse there. He's made a justice of the peace, so he's a very important person. He has workmen working for him. In the, so in the 30s, I think he's in Goochland, and by the late 30s, early 40s, he's over in, living in Hanover County. He's a justice of peace there. We find out his wife is named Jane, and he sold land in Essex County. I mean, this is piecing a lot together from what little we have. Um, and then he apparently <clears throat> moves to Williamsburg in around 1750 because uh, in 1747 the, the capital in Williamsburg burned and there was a debate which took about five years to resolve of whether or not they're going to keep the capital in Williamsburg or move it somewhere else in the colony more convenient and uh, they eventually come around in 1751 and, uh, and uh, 50 to build it and they hired a guy named William Walker who built Stratford Hall for the Lee family in Westmoreland County and built the tower on um, <clears throat> uh, St. Peter's Church in New Kent County in 1740. So they hire him. He's another big time builder that works. Uh, but unfortunately, Walker dies in 1750 and, and later uh, he, he, they hire James Skelton to take over that job. So in 1751, just read all the things that were happening in Walker's uh, life. He undertakes to rebuild the capital. Uh, his wife died in 1751. 
In 51, he loaned workmen to Carter's Grove uh, for uh, Lewis uh, Burrell to, to, to build that house. In 1720, he takes contract to build uh, an addition to Bruton Parish Church, uh, and I'll show you that. Uh, he takes the contract to build Abington Church in 1751 as well. So he's a busy man. He dies in 54, probably when all these things are still under construction, and that's why it took 75 years to sort it all out, his, his finances. So that may explain why uh, they're still trying to figure out to get paid. So this is Carter's Grove, so he's loaning some of his workmen. So that means he has a large crew. Don't know how large it was or who, but probably specialized bricklayers and carvers and uh, carpenters working for him. Uh, so Carter Burrell uh, hires in, uh, some of his men to work on this building. This is the second capital as it was reconstructed in 52 and 53. Uh, this is our best guess of what it looked like with this pedimented front. Uh, but that was uh, keeping uh, Skelton very busy in Williamsburg. One, uh, one week after the, spec the advertisement in the Gazette to build this church, that was February 7th, 1751, one week later, another advertisement in the Gazette from uh, notices given that on Friday the 15th of March, the vestry will be held at church in the said city in order to agree with workmen for building in addition to that said church. Any person willing to undertake the same by applying to the minister or church wardens may be informed of the particulars. In other words, a week later, he, he, he basically gets into two contracts that build, build major additions. So here's the Bruton Church that you know now. Uh, this is what it looked like when it was completed in 1716. Uh, it was uh, the very first of our cruciform churches in Virginia. Um, and I, we can give you some reasons in it why. is because they wanted to uh, not only accommodate the parish uh, uh, members of Bruton, but also the uh, government officials who would meet in Williamsburg at least twice a year. They, they, Basically, this was 27% of the contract uh, went, uh, was paid for by the, by the provincial government and the rest was paid for. I don't know how they ever got it built. They had two, two basically two contractors at work, two sets of workmen. I guess they all met together, but uh, it, was, it was something to behold. Anyway, this is it when it was first built, but then uh, it, what they wanted is more additions because by this time, by the 1750s, the number of uh, people who were um, serving in the House of Burgess is more than double because there were more counties. There was a lot more business going on. Uh, and so council members and Burgesses, basically, uh, they needed more space for them. So they added 25 feet uh, to the east to create a, a much deeper 100 foot long building. Uh, I did this a few years ago to, to give Bruton Parish an understanding of who sat where in their church in uh, 1750. So what you see is in 1716 we know that women sat on the south side and men sat on the north side. Uh, the students of, of William and Mary sat in the west gallery. The, the west gallery is the only interior fitting that still survives from that period of time. Uh, and then the sea of red is uh, government um, bureaucrats. Now they're, they're members of the House of Burgesses, the council, uh, and other uh, uh, people who work in the provincial government uh, are seated here. These blue, uh, these are private galleries, sort of like these. Uh, I don't know if these were built by private interest, but that's what and you build a private gallery if you're rich and you, don't want to, and you want to sit with your spouse, you could do that, otherwise you would be divided male and female uh, in Bruton Church and probably other, uh, other Anglican churches in the region as well. Um, but these get built by private individuals, this one first and then this one, and, um, and then here's the minister's pew. Uh, and, and they also build, uh, this is Skelton building a 
uh, they, they get their first organ in 1752, and um, uh, they have that, and so you can see uh, that it, it really has evolved. Uh, I just went through this and created this list, uh, more for me, I guess, than you, but it just give a different sense of the size of these buildings and where Abington fits in with the other cruciform. These are not all of them, but it's a goodly number. Uh, you get Abington is one of the largest ones that was built in this pattern. You can see they're also all over Tidewater, Virginia. This uh, map by Dell Upton in his book Holy Things and Profane sort of give you an idea that they're all along in Tidewater, Virginia. Uh, nothing too far inland. Um, and so this is a quick run through. The very next one based on Bruton Church is uh, what we call St. John's today or Elizabeth City in Hampton, uh, built by Henry Carey, who did a lot of public buildings in Williamsburg and was asked to build uh, this church in the late 1720s. So that's the first one. And then we start to get other David Minitry, who's a brick layer who lives in Williamsburg. Uh, and is, this brick is right here, uh, signed very nicely. Uh, builds this very large one for a rural parish, St. Stephen's Parish. It's now a um, Baptist church uh, after the great um, sort of collapse of Anglicanism, uh, but a very large one. And many of you know Christ Church in Lancaster County, 1732 to 35, based on dendrochronology and other documents. Uh, it is the best preserved of all the colonial churches in terms of its interior fittings, which is very interesting. Uh, it has this very fabulous frontispiece uh, with a quia sandstone, which is being imported from up in Stafford County. It, the quia sandstone is the same sandstone that was used to build uh, the White House in the Capitol much later. Uh, and uh, it has, these are called frontispieces, and you start to see them in the 17-teens. Uh, Vauder's Church that we saw is the earliest, uh, and they survive in, in, in only in Anglican churches in, uh, in Virginia. They don't, they don't show up anywhere else, and uh, you can also see them on very fine um, gentry houses uh, with this very nice brickwork, the rough brickwork, we can go out and rub the bricks. Uh, but also, I, I point out a, a little detail here, is that the, this putty joint was originally given a coat of red wash so that you wouldn't see these white lines, you just see from a distance a monumental red building. It's not fooling you that it's, it's not stone, but it, it gives that impression of monumentality. And um, it's out here too, you can see it when you go outside. Uh, so that's what they're doing. Inside, you can see the plan with the pews and their, their tall height of four and a half to five feet and uh, uh, lining all of the two cross alleys, as well as a very fine uh, altarpiece here uh, in the center, the pulpit surviving, and one uh, gallery that was built in the, in the south uh, wing, uh, probably about 20 years later. Uh, there are others that barely survived. This one, you'll see another picture of it later on, uh, but it has survived and has been reused and rehabilitated uh, up in Richmond County. Uh, and then some, uh, there are a couple of them that partially survived. When, thing, when the people were retrenching, they said, well, we can't afford to keep everything up, so we're going to cut off a couple of these wings and brick in between them. And this is the only... Uh, church in Virginia that has this apsidal end, or did have it, uh, up in Accomack County. And here's what's left of it. You can see that they cut the east-west uh, uh, section off. A uh, little bit larger, uh, Norfolk Church, 1739, uh, much altered. Uh, here's another one that near uh, uh, Christ Church in Lancaster County, uh, built about six or seven years later, St. Mary's. And again, in the 19th century, to sort of when you have to retrench, this is what they did. They cut off some of the wings here and basically filled in. You can see uh, the difference here 
where it's been filled in. So that originally this would be the east end here, and then they cut it off and fill in in between. And here's the front, well now the front side, looking at this side. So that's there. Uh, and you get a slightly different, more toward up the Potomac River, you get some churches that have, instead of these monumental windows that we have here, you get, uh, they divide the uh, facade into two levels of apertures. Uh, you don't see that down in this region, but certainly up in near Fairfax County and, and Stafford County and Aquia. And this Aquia church has uh, a lot of Aquia sandstone because the creek is right behind it. Um, it was built by a guy named Morning Richards who within three days of completing it, the church burned when the, when the shavings caught fire and he was bankrupt because there was no mechanics lien. So he basically had to throw himself on the, on the House of Burgesses to help bail him out to build this church because he was responsible for it until he turned it over to the vestry. Uh, so that was the end of his career, but he did a fabulous church. Uh, the, the two things that do survive is this, it, you'll n notice this, the, the altarpiece and that being <laughs> brought here somehow. <laughs> uh, in some places we only have the archaeology. This one uh, f uh, out in um, Falkir County, uh, uh, but a very interesting plan. And another one, here's one in, in uh, uh, had been Stafford, but now King George County, which was converted into a school in that collapsing period in the early 19th century. So, uh, but it, the double windows. So, cruciform churches. It has nothing to do with, with um, uh, theology. The cross is not symbolic of anything. It's just a way to span and add space when you have a large congregation. This is how Virginians um, resolve that in building churches like this, when, you, when you're expanding. And you, however, nobody else does it this way. Not in Maryland, uh, not in North Carolina, not in South Carolina, or any, any other uh, colony that was an Anglican colony. Instead, in Maryland, you see they built big boxes like this. And here, you, know, you can see this. This 3,000 square feet. So we're talking about a sizable congregation. And here's uh, St. Uh, Christ Church, uh, 3,300 square feet. But the, you know, basically, it's just a different approach. And the, you know, the, the question is, why did this happen? Well, I think in part because Virginia was left alone for so long that they carried on the traditional way of building and adding, making adding into into wings and things like that instead of building these big boxes. The next uh, colony that was actually where Anglicanism was established was in the 1690s in Maryland. So it's basically almost 100 years later uh, before that happened. And in South Carolina and North Carolina about a decade after that. And here, you know, here's some more Maryland churches of sizable uh, approaching almost 2,500 to 3,000 square feet. And this is how they uh, approached it. In South Carolina, it's the same way. And the, you notice many of them have uh, main entrances on the long walls instead of the uh, west end. Um, so this was just a different way of building. In part, it was response to what would have happened in England, as you might expect. And what happened in the 17th century in 1666, um, the fire of London and Christopher Wren was brought in to rebuild about 50 parish churches and he gave advice about building churches and he said the best kind of church and he used this one, St. Uh, James Piccadilly as a good example because it was built on a new site. It was uh, the proportions are about 1 to 1.6, uh, 90 by 60. Uh, he said that's the, the largest you can build a church that a voice, the minister's voice could carry, unless he was French, and apparently they could carry much further. Uh, but that, and so he used this as the ideal, and this is what people picked up, because where are their ideas coming from? From London. Everybody who was a, a, a minister in an Anglican parish church 
they reported to the Bishop of London. They had to be ordained there. So that's where they're getting their ideas. Poor Virginians here, you know, they're still kind of, they're still waiting for the bishop to show up. And they didn't come until 1907. Uh, it was too late. Uh, so this is the kind of church that everyone else built, unlike this one. All right, so that's, that's the reason why the plan is what it is. Now, the details that make it interesting is the fact that we're, it fits right in with Virginia architecture. This is the church, as you see, it's, it has this Flemish bond with glazed headers, which is very common from the late 17th century to the beginning of the uh, 1750s and 60s. Uh, we first see it at Fairfield. Thane and, and Dave excavated in 1694, and there we see it. It could be earlier, but there are not that many 17th century buildings around. Uh, they also, the other things that pick up, which are very common in these glazed headers, is that they would rub the bricks uh, in the corners around the jams of the windows and doors, and they'd have these frontispieces, pieces, uh, which are, again, setting things apart. These very fine frontispieces. pieces. Uh, you just don't see these in Maryland or North Carolina or anywhere else, but here in Virginia. Uh, some of these bricks, uh, these are actually one brick, but then uh, two bricks here, but they saw that one and fill in a little putty joint like that to make it look like it's two bricks. So that, you know, that's the kind of detail that they're playing around with. Um, here's the rubbed around the corners of, of the windows here. And one thing that sets this part, uh, this building apart, is it has this fluting uh, here for the architraves, which is highly unusual. You don't see that very often. And so that makes this kind of special here. Uh, so what survives inside? Well, as you know, it's the, uh, the two galleries here, uh, these very plain galleries, but still they're here. Uh, and they, they are of a Doric order, very simple, with raised paneling. Um, a few other places still survive. Here's a little bit uh, uh, different at uh, a quiet church where you still have, you have fluted uh, columns and a little bit more uh, detailed cornice around the lower edge than this plain cornice here. Uh, but this is the way you treat it. Uh, of course, the altarpiece, altarpieces start to come in in Virginia architecture in the 1720s. They get rid of this large windows in the east end and they make the windows uh, basically the same size all the way around, which gives you a space in the center of the east end where you can put this decorative architectural altarpiece with all the uh, texts that were required by canon law, the um, Apostles' Creed, uh, Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments done in this fashion. And it carries on straight through the, the uh, revolution. Not everyone had them. Sometimes they just have tablets nailed to the walls. There are a few of them uh, that survive at, at, in um, at St. Mary's White Chapel that are just tablets that are nailed to the wall. Uh, but this is a fabulous carved work. It's what we call enriched carving for the, the moldings here are enriched with egg and dart and these very fancy um, medallions in it. And so it's, it's a very fine uh, piece of woodwork. Uh, the, these things get repaired, replaced, and repainted, re, uh, 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 but they're, they're very fine. I just wanted to show you what he was also building in 1751-52 at Bruton Church. This is what's le this is before it was demolished in 1907. It's a fragment. So this is Bruton Church's altarpiece here, very similar arrangement. Uh, and here's yours. And it's also very interesting. Two different kind of carvers here between this more architecturally correct ionic order here and this free-flowing kind of uh, style in that one. Um, this comparison of Aquia, you, you sort of get a sense of that there's, there's a pattern here. Okay, so finally, uh, the last big major event here is building a new wall around this expanded church, uh, and there's the, the advertisements for it. It's built, it's repaired, it's knocked down, and, 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 it, and it accommodates earlier wall. Uh, you know, so here's the wall, it keeps going, but it takes in probably the wall of the earlier churchyard and parts of it. Then the war comes, the revolution, 
It's happening right here, 1781, and what we have after that, the results of it, is a collapse of the Anglican Church for a number of reasons. One, most of the ministers, uh, not all, but many of the ministers remain loyal to the crown, and so they were seen as suspect, and the Anglican Church was seen as suspect. Um, in 1784, uh, the, they finally arranged a way to continue a, um, uh, the, a, the Anglican Church in America, calling it the American Protestant, and being, getting ordained uh, bishops here and setting up that structure. But in 1786, the, uh, the passage of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom basically cut off the privilege of authority that the uh, Anglican and now Episcopal Church had, which is taxing everybody in them. And, and so they, they basically uh, can no longer raise funds out of public taxes to support the minister, the buildings, and uh, actually some of the uh, 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 social needs of, of the poor. Uh, that had a powerful impact as well. Uh, and so basically what we see between the 1790s and 1830 or so is the collapse of the Episcopal Church, where there was once perhaps 300 buildings. There are now maybe 40. Of that 40, a few survived and continue to be used. Uh, a, a number of them, basically between 17, 1800 and, and 1825, they were they were abandoned. There's trees that went growing up in the Christ Church in Middlesex County, uh, but the walls survived. Uh, some places were abandoned completely in the in the in the good Virginia tradition of looting abandoned spaces. So they, if you go to a, a parish where there was a parish church, you look around, and some of the best chimneys around are, are made from bricks that have been in a, in the parish church or the paving stones as well. Uh, so you can find out where it all went. Here's Farm Church, which I showed you. It's still functioning, but they, that's what it looked like in the 1890s without a, a roof on it. However, you survived. It's great. You, you managed to survive uh, without too much trouble in terms of physical uh, b things, but you did lose a number of, of members of the church. So in 1824, Bishop Richard Chang Moore visited Gloucester and he officiated at a large congregation at Ware Church. And on the following day, he said, I rode to Abington, but owing to the heavy rain, I preached to a small auditory. However, few are the parishes which hold up a stronger inducement for location of a clergyman than Gloucester. The people, notwithstanding their long privation of services of the church, continue their attachment to our communion. Within a few years, they have repaired one of their houses of worship and would furnish a clergyman of piety and talents with a comfortable support. So he had promise. And eventually, a few years later, they did uh, establish a, a minister here on a permanent basis, but they combined Ware and Abington parishes together, which it had, it continued on uh, through much of the 19th century. And there were changes that were made uh, to repair this after the Civil War and in 1890s as well. So here's a view uh, in 1930 by Francis Benjamin Johnson, who was a very famous photographer who traveled around the South photographing uh, houses and buildings. But you can see the altarpiece has been moved out from the wall uh, for a little space in between. And other, and you can see the, the 19th century uh, uh, benches uh, that replace these pews here. Uh, but it did survive. Here's her view in 1930, so it's not too bad. And here it is today, surviving and thriving, I would suspect. And thank you very much for, for being here and <laughs> opening the doors of the church. I may have gone a little far, but I think I still have some time if you have questions. Or a question or two? Yeah. Do you know about the property after, I mean, because this was, it was Church of England property, right? So how did they rectify that after the war? 
Uh, well, and, uh, the, it's typically the Baptists in 1802 were still trying to cut off the special privileges, and much of that was owning of glebes. Uh, that is, you know, church property he used to, to help support the minister. And uh, so they, a law was passed in 1802, basically saying, you got to sell that stuff off. Uh, and I'm not sure where the money went to that. But so, the church property remained property of the church. This remained property of the church. There's some, you know, sometimes the, if you go back, there are some churches, uh, it was sort of like a, a, an agreement that, you know, I will give you an acre or two acres of land so long, to build a church. So long as you keep a church, it, it, you can have it. But when it no longer becomes a church, it will revert to my family. And that's where some people got in trouble because, one, a lot of those agreements had disappeared because, as you know, Gloucester had lost its um, county records in, first in 1820 and then in 18, April 4th, 1865. So, um, you know, it's hard to trace some of that. And so there, that's why lawsuits are around trying to, uh, maybe that's why the, the, the payment for the work here lasted so long that they couldn't get it. Uh, Any other questions? Uh, yeah. No. Yep. You, you, there you go. You're the boss. We're, we're recording this uh, to broadcast later on, so we're trying to use the microphone. I've got one question. Do we think the panels on the altar would have been in the earlier church, or would they have been put in place at this construction? Uh, well, if it, if it were in the earlier church, it would be uh, from the period uh, late in that first church, because the architectural detailing of it is very nice mid 19th, uh, mid sorry mid 18th century detailing, and it would have been more what we call um, uh, election molding, uh, which would be more common in the in the 17th and early 18th century. So if it did, and there there is evidence of people just picking up stuff that you can pick up and move them back over to a to a new building. So that 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 could well have happened, but. In the lieu of having any evidence for it, uh, the only thing we can go on is the physical evidence itself, and that suggests that it's probably uh, mid-period, and whether it was purpose-built or not, uh, we don't know. But I can tell you that it probably, that did not exist in that first church. Some of the tablets could have, uh, because there would have been a large east window, and it would have blocked that east window. Um, thank you. I was very interested in your comment about Christchurch, Lancaster. That presumably was essentially a private chapel, wasn't it? It was heavily paid for by the, the Carter oh, family, by the Carter. but it was still, you know, people were still taxed for it. But what happens when you have gentry patrons is that you can, you can, I will cover the cost for it for you. Yeah. Uh, so I. You would love to know who those workmen were because some of that craftsmanship is exquisite. And also at the the altarpiece, as it wraps around and and you see them on the side of the of the east wing, uh, they have pediments, but the pediments are skewed, so they're they're you know they're not the the point is not in the center, but they're skewed. However, when you stand in the west end, you look at them; they look perfect. So, you know, nobody does that in Virginia. So they, he must have imported craftsmen, English craftsmen, to do that kind of work. I mean, it's very sophisticated, and it's far beyond what you see in most Virginia. So do we know what happened to um, Christchurch during the time when the Baptists were, <laughs> and the Method Methodesians <laughs> were taking were taking over in the taking area. over everything. Uh, it, it, it managed to survive. You know, they built a, a new. Uh, and part of the reason why the the fabric survives uh, after that hard time uh, was they built a new um, parish church in Kilmarnock, I guess it is. So that that meant it, it was occasionally used, but I think they recognized it as such an exquisite building and. Um, it, you know, it, it, the wall fell around, you know, the collapsed, 
but otherwise it, it pretty much survived, which is extraordinary. In the middle of the 18th century, did, did uh, undertakers typically augment their workforce with slave labor? That is to say, is it likely that maybe slave labor participated in the, in the erection of this church? Yes. Um, the trouble is, uh, no account books survive uh, f for basically any churches, but reading some of the vestry books when they're paying people every year, um, uh, when they're doing the accounts, they'll say, and not here because they don't exist, but they you know, paid Mr. Smith's uh, um, worker Joe. And if, it, you know, if it's just Joe, you know, it, it's, it's an enslaved person. Uh, so yes, that happens. And I suspect most uh, buildings like this, the labor, there would have been um, uh, enslaved labor that did things like cut timber. So I, I'm sure that uh, the, the roof framing and stuff like that, those trees were probably felled by enslaved people, possibly working for James Skelton, but also possibly done uh, by a parishioner who volunteered his workmen to do this, to supply the but timber. But there's no written evidence of that. No, no, I mean, the, all, all the vestry books are gone. Uh, that's what makes it such and a hard game. Un unrelated question, I noticed none of the churches that you had outhouses, uh, was, was that, uh, were there no outhouses in those days in the church related to church elves? I mean, we, we persist with that problem today. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> no, they're not like Quakers who built very convenient ones on just at the edges of their buildings. Uh, many of them are still there. Uh, nice five, six, seven hole um, uh, privies. Uh, but not, you know, there's, there's, there's no evidence in any any vestry book that I've seen about building what they called here necessary houses or houses of office is their euphemism. Um, you know, I may be wrong, but if, if so, it would be so rare. Um, and, you know, they didn't. Um, you know, different places had different uh, things to deal with. And up north, everybody is freezing. Uh, in church, and so they allowed them to build little tiny houses, like one-room houses, on the um, public grounds, so they could have a chimney, and they would go there between services, you know, between morning service and afternoon service, just to w fall out, uh, basically. But um, you know, I presume those would have chamber pots, um, and. Flemish bomb with glazed headers, I can tell you the measurements, too. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think you, 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 know, you have a parish house that is about as close as you can get. Um, when speaking of the parish house, there's a fabulous reception over there where we can have some of our more chit-chat questions and time with each other and time with Mr. Lounsbury to ask some follow-up. So thank you very much for thank you. this important presentation. Our post for the reception is the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Augustine Warner Chapter. It celebrated their 70th year last year, so they are 71 years strong. Um, a good group that meets here and is sharing their time with us. So let us have a blessing for our time over there. Lord, thank you for this day and for the blessings you give us. Thank you for the hands that have prepared the food and the conversation and your presence that will follow. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope to see you next week for our final presentation, which is by John Erickson of Christ Church, uh, excuse me, St. Luke's in Smithfield.